Hi, this is Ibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I'm also the host of Moms Don't Have Time to Lose Weight, and I'm the editor of the anthology, which you should run out and buy, called Moms Don't Have Time to, a quarantine anthology. All proceeds of that book go to COVID-19 vaccine research. And I'm the editor-in-chief of Moms Don't Have Time to Write, a new publication on Medium, and we're accepting submissions, so please send your personal essays there. And if all that isn't enough, you can follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens, and my website is zibbyowens.com. Okay, now back to this amazing podcast. Welcome, Judy. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I'm so excited to talk about the light of days. I am so excited to be here. Um, So for anyone listening, Judy and I did an Instagram live at the beginning of the pandemic when her book was pushed back, what, a year. Um, What was your original pub date? June? Uh, June 23rd. It was pushed by 10 months. Oh my gosh. That was such, I was just saying that was like such a low moment was when, I mean, I was like, how do you feel? And you're like, okay. (laughs) Anyway, finally, here we are on the other side of something. And at least now this book is finally coming out and you must feel so relieved, I hope. Or are you still apprehensive? Um, I mean, you know, who knows what will happen in the next five weeks. Life has been so day by day. Um, no, I am very excited. It um, looks like it should be coming out on April 6th. Um, Amazing. Yeah. So there are so many great things about your book. And let me just tell the subtitle is The Untold Story of Women Resistance Fighters in Hitler's Ghettos. And you started off with a very personal introduction about your own family history and how you ended up writing this book and the trauma that has been sort of inherited in generations from, through your own family and how, well, t- so why don't we start with that? Tell, tell us the background about your own family's Holocaust story and how your grandmother used to tell it to you every afternoon, which must have been very uplifting after school, <laughs> tea and cookies and Holocaust stories from your Zeta or Bubby or whatever. So tell me, tell me a little bit, just start, start there with that tragedy. And it, by the way, it was milk and cookies, the cookies with like the jam inside and the chocolate with the sprinkles. Um, uh, yeah, my mother's uh, family were Holocaust survivors. My grandmother and grandfather, um, they, they escaped occupied Warsaw um, earlier on in the war. Um, I don't even know if I mentioned this in this book. My grandmother always tells a story. She used to always tell a story. She's no longer with us about how um, she'd be in the, she didn't look as Jewish as the rest of her family, which becomes a huge theme in my book as well. And so she went and stood in the ration lines uh, collecting food and bread for her family. And she would hear people sort of disclose where Jews were hiding and she sensed the really insidious danger of staying in Poland. Um, And they left, they left quite early and lucky for them, they decided to flee east instead of west. So they went toward the Soviet Union um, and along the way, they stayed with one of my grandfather's brothers who was actually killed while they were with him. My grandfather had a bullet, um, a mark from the bullet grazed his neck and shot his brother in the heart. And that was, I mean, that's something we always, I grew up with that bullet mark. Um, but my grandparents through, um, they were helped at a, I don't even talk about this in the book. So I'm glad we're getting a chance. They were helped through um, at a convent by nuns, they were, um, they escaped partway by swimming, partway in a, in a, I believe, you know, I'm putting together a lot of stories from the family, but they were, I remember my grandmother telling me they were in a truck that carried fruit and they were hidden in the truck and they made their way to the Soviet Union uh, or to Russia at the time. And they, they were then like many Jews who went East um, transported to Siberian gulags, to camps in Siberia where, and, and that is how they survived. And in fact, the bulk of Polish Jews who did survive were survived because they survived in these camps in Russia, which in and of themselves were, uh, you know, really uh, apparently very horrible living conditions. They were work camps in Siberia. Almost nobody writes about that experience. That's the next project. <laughs> no, it's not, but that's another 
work on people and they were then called the Asian Jews. These were the Polish Jews that went east and, and survived because of, because of that. So that, that's my family story, um, which is not the same as the story I tell um, in this I know, book. but I just like to find out about <laughs> more about you. Um, the way you even wrote about it, um, about, uh, can I just read this little section when you talk about your family? And then we'll talk about the, book, the rest of the book and everything. Um, but you wrote, I come from a family of Polish Jewish Holocaust survivors. My bubby Zelda, namesake to my eldest daughter, did not fight in the resistance, but her successful but tragic escape story shaped my understanding of survival. She, who did not like Jew look Jewish with her high cheekbones and pinched nose, fled occupied Warsaw, swam across rivers, hid in a convent, flirted with a Nazi who turned a blind eye, and was transported in a truck carrying oranges eastward, finally stealing across the Russian border where her life was saved, ironically, by being forced into Siberian war camps. My bubby was strong as an ox, but she'd lost her parents and three of her four sisters, all of whom had remained in Warsaw. She'd relay this dreadful story to me every single afternoon as she babysat me after school, tears and fury in her eyes. Oh, I mean, that's a lot. That's just a lot. And obviously you've given more color to this little excerpt, but um, you've taken your whole family history and whatever gets transmitted therein. And then you fast forward and you're in London as like a stand-up comic, right? <laughs> Newly dealing with your own identity as like what you called sort of being out as a Jew, which in London you felt like wasn't really okay. Tell me about that. Cause that's something that I found very surprising also. Well, first of all, this was a long time ago. Uh, I mean, a long time ago. It was about 15 years ago. So things I, I, things might be different now. It wasn't that it was. I felt very self-conscious. I, I was very much an American Jew uh, on stage. By the way, I'm Canadian, but that didn't matter. I didn't seem Canadian. Um, you know, people would refer to me as like uh, the female Woody Allen. Um, I, I think because of my glasses and my look, um, you know, that was, I was very, I, I was um, presented as a Jew. I was taken as a Jew. Um, I was received as one. And because I had grown up in this, not just Holocaust survivor family, I grew up in a Holocaust survivor community in Montreal. Um, I went to a Jewish day school. I went to uh, you know, college on the East Coast and Ivy League college. I mean, I grew up in very Jewish milieus where it was not a thing. Even being from a Holocaust survivor family was not unique. My whole community was like that. So suddenly in London, I found myself in uh, a different context where being Jewish was different. Uh, being an American Jew or at seeming like an American Jew was different. Um, and that suddenly I became very self-conscious about that. Wow. And then you dove deep into the research because you're also like a brilliant academic wonderkind, essentially. And you started looking for more stories in the library of um, Jewish women warriors and uncovered this like treasure trove of stories. And that's part of how this book came to be, right? Or maybe you should just tell it. <laughs> Well, first of all, I, I, I roll my eyes at Wunderkind. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm more of a, uh, I, I used to call myself a career slut because I'm all over the place. <laughs> um, I've worked in lots of different ways and lots of different things. Yes, I found this book completely um, by accident. I was doing research on strong Jewish women. There's one woman who stood out in my mind because I studied her in fifth grade. Her name was Hana Senesh. Um, for those who hadn't heard of her, she was, uh, she lived in what was then Palestine and she joined the British army. She was a paratrooper. She went back to um, her native Hungary. She was a young Jewish woman. She was caught, but she looked the Nazis in the eye when they shot her. And this was stayed with me. And this was, she became the symbol of Jewish female bravado. Um, so I, but I wanted to find out like, who was she? Aside from this kind of heroic narrative that I grew up with at Jewish day school, and she was amazing, you know, but who was she? Who was this person who defied the Nazis like that? Why one of millions? Like, who was she? What was her psychology? Um, so I went to the British library because I was living in London and looked her up and there were not that many books about Hannah Senesh. So I just ordered whatever they had. It was like on a catalog and then you had to go up to a desk and get your books. And I got my little stack 
And one of them was like this really old book, you know, in like a warm blue fabric with the yellowing edges and that smell of, of that yellowing smell almost. And it had gold lettering and they open it up and it's 200 pages of like tiny script in Yiddish. But the crazy part is I happen to speak Yiddish. Um, so I'm actually able to read this book. Now I was gonna put it aside because it looked so hard. I mean, like tiny script. I, I was living in London. I was working in stand-up in academia in the art world. Like my, I wasn't using Yiddish. It was my Yiddish was rusty. So this looked like this looked hard. But the like academic in me was like, no, no, look at everything, look at everything. So I started flipping through this book, looking for Hannah Senesh. She's not there. She's in the last 10 pages. In front of her, there's like 180, 190 pages of other Jewish women with pictures, with these little brief bios or kind of snippets. And the chapter titles are like Ode to Weapons and Guns and Ammunition. I should say, I, I forgot to mention, the title of the book was in Yiddish, Freuen in die Ghettos, which is Women in the Ghettos. So I had come to it expecting the kind of Holocaust story that I'd grown up with that was obviously going to be difficult and sad and tragic and traumatic. And instead it was like about guns and bullets and ammunition and fighting. And it was just so, so shocking to me. This was not the story that I knew at all. And you even say in, in the book that it was so obvious to people at the time that the women were going to go down in history for what they did, right? It, it was like taken for granted. And yet the narrative of the Holocaust has evolved in such a way that actually you, you said something like there's such resistance to resistance, right? There's for whatever reason, people don't want to discuss or share. And so this whole piece of history has been lost. And I feel like the way you present it in the book, I was like sort of going along with you on this journey. And I was like, good, look at that. Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like I'm like, as a Jewish woman also, you know, like, well, I'm glad that they all were trying so hard because from our point of view here in like 2021 or whatever, it, it's like, oh my gosh, like they were, they, they had no shot. They like, there was no chance for them. Like they couldn't even have, but then look what they did. And it's just like something to marvel at. And of course that's like the next couple hundred. <laughs> that's like your whole story. It's like, look what they did. And it's just so amazing, right? It's so exciting. It's so exciting. It's so exciting. And, but like, you know, they didn't really have a shot. They didn't have a shot at, at beating the German army. And they knew that, I mean, but they still fought them because it was so important to fight for justice and liberty and fairness. And they were angry and they were fueled by passion and they were not going to just let this go. Don't you feel great that like you've like reunited with these ghost warriors in a way? Like that like they're all kind of like, you know, I mean, that sounds like ridiculous, but I just feel like they're like, um, you know, coming like they're <laughs> like, you didn't know they were there. And then all of a sudden they're, they're the appearances of like all these women who had been wiped out. And now all of a sudden, like they, they like pop up in different forms. That sounded like ridiculous, but that's sort of like how it's popping up to me in my head. Right. <laughs> So some of the women survived and they were, those became the main characters in my book because they left testimonies or memoirs or, and had families or had material I could work with. Um, and some of them did not survive. Those, the, some of them had friends who wrote eulogies or I worked with material that others had written about them. But sometimes those women that didn't survive, I feel like a, a granddaughter or something. Mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, I... It like makes me cry. I'm like talking to you now. I feel like crying. Like, I feel like, you know, they never, they, they didn't live. They couldn't have had a granddaughter. So I'm like trying to fill in <laughs> for whatever granddaughter, you know, from Kaplitnitska never had. Um, and I feel a great duty to, to these women, especially those that never, uh, even those that told their stories, but hadn't been widely heard. Um, and especially those that never got to tell their stories. I, I feel, yeah, I feel, you know, this project was one where I feel very excited, but I also, it's always been one that felt a great duty. You know, mm -hmm. there's also been a kind of burden of, I, ha I have to do this. Wow. Um, That's, um, it's just so 
amazingly generous and like it's just amazing the gift you're giving to the world by all of your research and getting this out there um all of these souls who have like you know been extinguished and even the people you know reina is that her name reina renya um who you. right you had or the memoirs that exist that are actually then buried you know even to just put a spotlight on them again is an act of goodness if you will so Renya, my main character, her memoir was published in English in the U.S. in 1947. It, it, I, you can buy it. You can buy a collector. Like, I bought these books, um, but the stories got drowned out for, for many reasons, which I get into at the end of the book. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, yeah, like, it's in a way that's even more incredible <laughs> that we, they did try to sell these stories, sell, that, you know, tell these stories early on, but the way that we, the way that history ends up being constructed, the way our memories are shaped, the way our stories of who we are, are shaped really, it's been, it's very interesting, really, you know, is shifts with time, shifts with politics. There are reasons why certain stories are remembered, certain aren't, so. So I know, so this, is this still gonna be, I haven't even double check this with you. Last time we spoke, this was going to be um, a film or TV adaptation. What's the latest on that? Um, it is, it has been optioned for film and we, I am, I'm, we're just starting to co-write the screenplay and I, I'm working on it with a screenwriter. Um, so it's, it's like very early days. So I, I, I like don't have the, I can't tell you anything juicy because I we don't know yet. <laughs> Um, but you know, it's a long process, but you know, we're, we are hoping, um, I mean, it's such a dramatic story and it's also like, I keep saying it's so, so much of the story is about the reason Jewish women were able to take on such an important role in the resistance and in the underground is because they dressed up. This is a story of costume. This is a story about fashion as well. This is a story about Jewish women pretending to be Catholic girls. And so it's very, it's, I mean, it's dramatic, it's filmic in so many ways. Um, so yes, here's hoping. <laughs> so what I was going to say, not that I have any expertise in this area at all, but like, to me, I'm really drawn to your story, right? Cause I relate to you. You're, I mean, you're best friends with a really good friend of mine. And so that alone, but like, just as another similarly aged Jewish woman in the world today, I love seeing like the images like that you had in your introduction, even like you in the library. Like, I, I'm wondering if you're going to interweave your own story with the story, or if it's just going to all be like a flashback to that whole time. And it'll be like start to finish during that time. Or if you're going to have it more like sort of a Julie and Julia, where you have like Julia child and then Julie Powell in the kitchen and, you know, more like that. Any thoughts? Um, yeah. So I should, should just say for a reader. So in the book, the first chapter and the very last chapter are my, they're told from my perspective about first I'm setting up how this I came to this and then at the end I talk a bit about my journeys and my travels and researches um at the moment no the the movie is going to be really set in the time and the, the idea is it's really trying to showcase this incredible um uh Jewish history these incredible women and what they did and what they went through um, but we could write another movie about, <laughs> about my story. So let's talk later. <laughs> you know, um, like in Titanic, I'm just like, it doesn't have to be the main narrative, but like in Titanic, when you're like in present day, right on the ship, and then you go into the whole story, but you kind of yeah. know in the back of your head that you're linked to someone in the president in the movie who you're also kind of rooting for. I don't know. So we have, we have talked about that. Okay. Um, at the moment, that's not how, but it's like so early, like, you know, these things go, as you, you they go through so many changes and drafts and things. So yeah, well, I, I don't want to. Now I have your vote. I have your input. <laughs> I can bring it. Yeah, oh my gosh. Know. So how long did this whole project take you? I mean, this is a massive undertaking. And I have to say, I did not re get all the way to the end, but I, there are like 50 pages of notes, but it was, what is it like 450 pages, but it's amazing. Um, and the way you write, even the way you start your chapters, right? You had some chapter, wait, I just wanted to find this opening sentence. Um, no, not this one. Let's see, I, I don't even know why I try. I, anyway, it was really good. <laughs> oh, here, rumors flew like shots. 
That's such a great opening sentence for a chapter. I feel like you can tell a lot from the first sentence of every chapter, right? Is it going to draw you in? Like, what does it say? How is it written? And it's like, what? What's going on? What rumors? What's, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, I just love your style of writing. That was just one little example. Thank you very, very much. That really means a lot to me. As a, as I'm a, a writer first, I always feel like. So thank you. Um, what was the question? Um... Tell me how long it took the whole process. Oh, how long it took, yeah. Yeah. So, so this project, I found that Yiddish book by accident 14 years ago. Oh my um, God. But I, as I said, there's, an, there was an, there's always been ambivalence with this, especially at the beginning. When I found this book, I was 30 years old. I was single. I was living in London. I was finding myself like the last thing I wanted to do was spend my days in 1943 in the Holocaust. If anything, I was living in London because I escaped my family. I didn't want to deal with the Holocaust. So, you know, as I said, there was a sense of duty about this project and at times excitement, but also at times like, oh, this is, this is hard emotionally, intellectually, um, practically. This is a very hard project. So anyways, I, I worked on many other things during that time. I've written other books. I've done many other projects. Um, but from that get-go, but I knew like I couldn't let it go. All this time I couldn't let it go. So I immediately um, applied for translation grants because it was a Yiddish book. And I said, I bet I, I knew I like I had to translate this. I got grants. I was supposed to do it in a year. It dragged on for like five, seven years. I really and I'm a very organized person, but this was the one thing in my life I like couldn't. I couldn't finish. I couldn't really fully get to. I, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to go there. I mean, these are really hard stories. And it took until, uh, and then I was going to publish this as an academic piece. And then I, could, I was going to collaborate with an academic who was going to write extensive footnotes explaining that Yiddish text, which has no context whatsoever. And then I didn't know, and then, and then Trump got elected. And around this time, there was these books like Hidden Figures and Code Girls. And there was around 2016, 2017, there suddenly was a lot more of women's interest. There was, and, and so what happened was, there was interest in these hidden women's stories. And I started thinking about writing this as a novel because I thought that would be easier than having to track down the, the, I didn't know any, I mean, I mean, this is hard to research. So writing it as fiction would kind of get me off the research hook to some degree. So I started writing it as a novel. And then there was the big first women's march. And a few days after that, I happened to meet my agent, my literary agent for breakfast. And this is, I never told anyone the story. So, and I mentioned to her, we met about something different, but I mentioned to her that I was writing this novel based on this Yiddish book that I found that I was going to do as an academic book. And, and she like stopped me in the restaurant. I was like, wait a second, Jewish women were blowing up Nazi trains. And I was like, yeah, she's like, this really happened. I said, yeah, this really happened. But I'm, and she was like, no, 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 Judy you have to do this as a nonfiction project because you have to tell the truth of this story. This, it's very important to do that. Um, and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, and, then, and then, so then I went up and she said, Judy, write me a proposal. Just do a short proposal and we'll work on it from there. And for six months, I wrote a comic novel. I wrote a, I still couldn't commit to this. And then once I'd done that and like put it in a drawer, then I like quickly wrote a proposal for this and, and it like, it, it sold very quick. I mean, the whole thing then happened very quickly, but it was like, I stalled. Like some of the reason this took so long is I personally, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready emotionally to do this. And it, and it was very hard. It was, it's a very, I have to travel the world. I'm working with, you know, hundreds of testimonies and documents in Polish, Yiddish, Hebrew, German, Russian. I, I had to hire a number of translator. I was like running a cottage industry around like just the, the source documents. Um, I speak Hebrew and Yiddish, but I still needed some help. I don't speak Polish at all. 
um, sorry, I'm going on a little bit, but you, you know, this is, no, this I'm is fascinated. I really, um, it took a really, it took a lot of people. It took a long time to bring this together. And, and yeah, it took me a long time to be at a place where I was ready to do this. Wow. And now that you're <laughs> ushering it into, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, I, I, I've talked too much. No, you have not. No, finish. What were you going to say? Go ahead. You are the book's 400 pages. Um, I, I, um, no, I was going to say it was also, you know, there, there's no book out there about Jewish resistance in Poland at all. So it's not like I, there's a book about Jewish resistance, a history, and then I'm going to tell the women's side of the story that, that there's no book about, there are books about specific people. There are books about Vilna or Kovno or Warsaw, but there is no English or even like book, a broad book about Jewish resistance in Poland. So I had to put together the chronology, like six months I spent making a timeline. Like you're in like second grade when you're, I was like, okay, this happened. And then, the, oh, this happened then. Oh, the, oh, this story, because I was working for memoirs. So I'm taking people's personal stories, which by the way, are filled with inconsistencies and mistakes and, and, you know, even things they didn't want to say because it was during the war. This was about the underground or secrets. So I had to work with all these very, you know, uh, semi-reliable sources and create a reliable historical narrative. So that was very, very complicated. Okay, I, I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> I, I find this whole thing fascinating because this is not how like a typical, isn't it crazy that like, two books can like I could grab any other random book right and this is just like someone sat down and that was in their head and they just drafted it and it was all made up right like fiction it's not to say it's not a lot of work fiction is a tremendous amount of work in the craft and blah blah, blah. I'm just saying like something can come completely out of your head and you can funnel it onto the page and then something else can be like all of those people working on it and documents. And yet when you're holding them, they, they're just like two, you know what I mean? Like you wouldn't know there should, I feel like there should be better markings, like a better way to tell books. I mean, I know the covers say a lot, but like something like, I don't know, some marking, like, I, I don't know, some system, like, cause they look so similar, but they're so different. Like even where do you go in this book? Like you should open it up and there'll be like, you know, little pictures of like, here's where you're going to travel. Like, you know, <laughs> never mind. Anyway, now I'm rambling. All to say, I'm super impressed with all the work and research that it took. Um, and I'm delighted that you did it. It's like a mitzvah to the Jewish people and to everyone. Um, Cause everybody has lived through this in some way, shape or form, this part of history. And it's really remarkable. So I'm going back to Wonderkin. Sorry. I'm just going to keep it um, on the table. <laughs> um, so I know you've done like a million other things as well. Um, and I read, by the way, part of your memoir, which I didn't even talk about um, white walls. And that's like a whole nother podcast we could have. Um, what, what are you going to do next? Like what's, this is finally coming out. Like, are you done now with all sorts of writing? Are you going back to comedy? Like, what's your thinking? Yeah, I definitely. I, 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 I mean, I don't think I'll, <laughs> I'm always saying I'm done with writing. I'm done with writing. And then like the next day I have like 25 ideas. Um, I, uh, I, I definitely cannot work on something this difficult emotionally for a while. Um, I can't, you know, there's so many I, things I found out. I'm like, I could write about, like I was saying before, this, the Soviet Jews and this, and I, and I actually can't. Um, no, I have to write humor right now. So my next projects are going to be, I hope, uh, a humorous novel. I, I, I need it. I need a breather from this. That's you know, okay. I have friends who work in like social work and amazing, you know, innovative and, and caring and difficult aid work and, and, I also ask them, how do they deal with it? And often they have, they actually have professional help. They work as part of organizations that are like therapists and social workers, and they have colleagues. And if this was like me by myself, reading a lot of traumatic material. Um, it was, it, yeah, as what we said before, it was very, it was very taxing. Um, so yes, I, I, I am, I'm not doing this again for some time. I say, I'll probably do it anyways, but uh, <laughs> I need to change the pace. 
Okay. That sounds good. <laughs> Do you have any advice for aspiring authors? Um, I have, uh, I'm one of those people of like every bit of advice. I'll find the opposite advice, but I, you know, something for me that re I really, really need external deadlines. I am not someone that can, you know, I have friends that are like, oh, I went to before the pandemic, I went to London for a week and I locked myself in a, in a Airbnb and I just wrote this. I like, I don't work that way. I need to know that something is due to somebody else on a certain day. And so I create those external deadlines for myself. And I recommend that to people that need that. Uh, like I, I even called my agent recently. I was like, set me a deadline for this other book. I'm like, I need, she, so she was like, okay. And she's like, okay, 40 pages by April 1st. I was like, okay, 40 pages, April 1st. Like I need that sense of the external to motivate me to do it. And what, so what's your advice? My advice, if that's a kind if that, you know, do that for yourself, if that helps. Um, I think it can help cast away doubt. I think for me, it's the doubt. So if I know that something is coming up, I just have to do it. So I can't think about it. And I think that's, and, and I think that's a big part of it. So um, try to try to set yourself deadlines. And even if it's like, you're going to give it to your partner or friend to read, even if you don't even give it to them, um, just to hold you accountable to a certain deadline, I think can be very helpful for some people. I love that. That makes sense. No, I'm the same way. I make artificial deadlines before my real deadlines. And then I stress out about those deadlines because I'm like, I have to get it done at least a week before. And then it comes like a week before. And I'm like, oh my gosh, well, I should, I should really beat that deadline too. <laughs> it's so silly. These mind games I play, but I put it like in my calendar, like, you know, something just came up and I'm like, oh, I did that like three weeks ago, you know, <laughs> but I had to put it in so that I would do it today, even though it, I had like three weeks to do it. I know. So I get it crazy he thinks it's something to do with having to have anxiety to produce something mm. and creating my own anxiety and you know he's been married to a writer now for enough time that he's like oh god but I I yeah it's something it is I think it, it, I can't I, I don't know I think some people can write in pleasure or something I can't no it I need to have, have I need some structure feel. I don't know it's some sort of like lingering school-based mentality after like yeah. you go through school and graduate school and like all this stuff like what now all of a sudden nothing's ever due like are you kidding yeah. me come on oh. what does it do oh. what does it do so yeah that's how I, I am. maybe our, our husbands can like go talk about you know <laughs> what it's like to be married to somebody completely neurotic and whatever but um anyway um, oh, and I forgot to mention, I'm sorry, your young readers edition of this um, also is coming out. When is, is it the same time exactly or? Coming out at the same time. And uh, yeah, it's intended for ages like over age 10, 10 to 14 plus. Um, I worked with someone who um, specializes in that age range. So we collaborated on this. Um, and yeah, I'm actually really excited about that. Um, and yeah. Uh, you know, it's really feels, it, you know, it's a feels important for me to share this story, not just with, with grownups, but with young Jewish women, because most of the characters in my book were teenagers, these women rebelling against the Nazis, the oldest one was 25. And that was like the old leader. These were my, my main character was 15 when the war began. So these were teenage early 20s um, uh, Jews fighting the Nazis. So Yes, it, it, I found that young readers really um, connect with the material in a very different way, um, but it's it's very exciting. Yeah. Meanwhile, my I'm daughter, very excited about it. my daughter is like thirteen and is like, "Can you make me a smoothie?" I'm like, "It's right here," you know. And now you're they're like people in Poland, like organizing entire resistance movements. It's like, "Could you bring me up some water?" And I'm like, "Really?" <laughs> Anyway, all right. Well, Judy, it was so fun talking to you, even though, I mean, fun is maybe the wrong word. It's always fun being with you. Um, it was moving and um, invigorating and um, spiritual and soulful discussing the topic at hand as well. Um, and yeah, I'm glad it's finally coming out into the world. And maybe this is just the time it's meant to, this is the way it was meant to be. I don't know. So congratulations. Thank you so much. 
for and for asking great questions and probing and paying attention and being so supportive of this. Thank you. Of course, of course. All right. Well, next time in person. <laughs> I pray. I pray. All right. Bye, Judy. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music.